Surely the Savior knows her very well. That is why he loves her more than us. And on that, welcome back to my channel. I am Joshua T. Whaley, author of Lost Cannibal Manifesto, amongst other titles, including the upcoming book titled For Ben Genesis, The Untold Story of Man. Instead of a long intro, we have a very special work today, so let's go ahead and delve into it. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene is an ancient text dated to the early 2nd century by an unknown author and is part of the Berlin Codex, but was not found in the Nag Hammadi discovery. There are only three highly damaged but surviving copies of the Gospel, with the most intact one being written in Coptic, and the smaller fragments both being written in Greek. In this text, we are given an alternate view of salvation as coming from within and not from an external source, such as we learn in the Gospel of Thomas with the Savior's words, Heaven is found within. This leads us to the question, who was Mary? Well, in the Christian Orthodoxy, Mary of Magdala, who is also referred to as Mary Magdalene, was a crucial central figure in both the canonical and non-canonical texts. And the canonical ones, her story quite possibly begins when she is cleansed of seven demons by the Savior Yeshua. However, there is some debate if that woman was indeed Mary Magdalene. However, there is a great misconception that Mary was a Reformed prostitute. There is no credible documentation that states this. Only the misogynistic intent of the original church fathers who deemed to put women beneath men as second-class citizens in the hierarchy of humanity. Yes, Mary Magdalene's story was changed by the tyrant known as Pope Gregory I in 591 CE because of his personal fear of women, forever linking this horrible lie to what most Orthodox Christians believe today. They are wrong. In 2016, Pope Francis even elevated the memory of Mary Magdalene, referring to her as the Apostle of Apostles due to her role in announcing the resurrection, and quite possibly because the Catholic Church knows who she truly was. So the question we are confronted with now is, if she wasn't who Pope Gregory I made her out to be, then who was she? We will find these answers in the non-canonical Gospels or texts where Mary is believed to have been something much more than just a follower of Yeshua. In some of the Apocrypha and Gnostic texts, we are given a much deeper glimpse into the relationship between the Savior and Mary, with phrases like he meaning Yeshua, would kiss her on the lips, as found in the Gospel of Philip. Or, as in this Gospel, that is why he, again, meaning Yeshua, loved her more than us. But probably the most profound connection between Yeshua and Mary is found in Pistis Sophia, where Yeshua states, Mary, thou blessed one, who I will perfect in all mysteries of those of the height discord and openness, thou whose heart is raised to the kingdom of heaven more than all thy brethren. This has led some to believe, myself included, that Yeshua and Mary were indeed husband and wife. But I ask you this question. Does this belief change one thing about who Yeshua was or who he claimed to be? If your answer is no, it does not, then you understand the most essential part of the story of Yeshua was his teachings in all their forms. With that, let's begin with my modern interpretation of the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Now, unfortunately, the ravages of time have consumed pages 1 through 6 of the original text which contain chapter 1 through 3. So the gospel picks up on page 7 in chapter 4. Will matter be obliterated then, or not? The Savior remarked, All of nature, all formations, and all beings exist in connection with one another, and they will ultimately 
return to their original roots. The essence of matter returns solely to the roots of its own nature. He who is receptive, let him listen. Peter asks him, Since you've clarified everything for us, can you also explain this? Why is the sin of the world? The Savior responded, There is no sin. But it's you who create sin when you engage in actions resembling adultery, which is termed sin. This is why the good enter your midst, to the core of every nature, to bring it back to its origin. He then added, This is why you experience illness and death, for you are separated from the one who can heal you. He who is willing to comprehend, let him comprehend. Matter is given rise to an unparalleled passion that stems from something unnatural. This could quite possibly mean the demiurge. Consequently, a disturbance occurs throughout the entire body. This is why I advise you to be courageous if you find yourself disheartened, find encouragement in various forms of nature. He is who is receptive, let him listen. After the Blessed One spoke these words, he greeted them all, saying, Peace be with you. Accept my peace into yourselves. Take care that no one leads you astray by saying, Look here, or look there, for the Son of Man resides within you. Pursue him. Those who seek him will discover him. Go then and spread the good news of the kingdom. Do not impose any rules beyond what I have instructed you, and do not create a law like the lawgiver, lest you be bound by it. After saying this, he departed. Chapter 5 They were filled with sorrow, weeping intensely and saying, How can we go to the Gentiles and share the gospel of the kingdom of the Son of Man? If they do not save him, how can we expect to be spared? Then Mary rose, addressed them all, and said to her brothers, Do not weep, do not be sad, nor lose heart, for his grace will be fully with you and will shield you. Instead, let us celebrate His greatness, for He has prepared us and formed us into men. When Mary spoke these words, she turned their hearts towards the good, and they began to talk about the teachings of the Savior. Peter said to Mary, Sister, we know that the Savior cherished you more than any other woman. Share with us the teachings of the Savior that you remember and that we do not know, nor have we heard. Mary replied, What you do not know, I will reveal to you. She then began to share with them the following words. I, she said, I encountered the Lord in a vision and said to him, Lord, I saw you today in a vision. He responded and said to me, Blessed are you because you did not falter at the sight of me. For where the mind is, there is your treasure. I asked him, Lord, how does the one who sees the vision perceive it? Through the soul or through the spirit? The Savior replied, He does not perceive through the soul nor through the spirit, but rather through the mind that lies between the two. That is what perceives the vision. And that is. It is unknown what Yeshua said following, and that is, as pages 11 through 14 are missing from the original text. Talk about a cliffhanger. Chapter 8. And the second power, desire, exclaimed, I did not observe your descent. 
but I now witness your assent. Why do you deceive, since you belong to me? The soul responded, I saw you. You were unaware of me and did not recognize me. I served as your garment, yet you did not know my true nature. Upon saying this, the soul departed with great joy. It was then approached by the third power, known as ignorance. This power questioned the soul, asking, Where are you heading? You are bound in wickedness, but you are restrained. Do not judge. The soul replied, Why do you condemn me when I have not condemned anyone? I was bound, yet I did not bind. I was unrecognized, but I recognized that all is being dissolved, both earthly and heavenly. After overcoming the third power, the soul ascended and encountered the fourth power, which manifests in seven forms. The first form is darkness. The second is desire. The third is ignorance. The fourth embodies the fear of death. The fifth represents the dominion of the flesh. The sixth is the misguided wisdom of the flesh. And the seventh is wrathful wisdom. These are the seven powers of wrath. They then question the soul, asking, From where do you come, slayer of men? Or where are you heading, conqueror of the void? The soul answered, What confines me has been defeated, and what turns me away has been vanquished, and my desire has ceased, and ignorance has perished. In an aeon I was liberated from a world, and in a type from a type, and from the transcended chains of oblivion. From this moment on I will achieve the rest of the time the season, the aeon, in silence. Chapter 9 After Mary spoke, she became quiet, as this was the point at which the Savior had conversed with her. However, Andrew responded and said to the others, Speak your minds about what she has shared. Personally, I do not believe that the Savior said this. These teachings are certainly peculiar, Peter then spoke about these matters. He asked them about the Savior. Did he truly speak privately with a woman and not openly to us? Are we meant to turn and listen to her? Did he choose her over us? At this, Mary cried and said to Peter, My brother Peter, what is your opinion? Do you believe I devise this in my mind or that I am deceiving you about the Savior? Levi, also known as Matthew, replied and said to Peter, Peter, you have always been quick-tempered. Now I see you arguing against the woman like an opponent. But if the Savior deemed her worthy, who were you to dismiss her? Surely the Savior knows her very well. That is why he loved her more than us. Rather, let us feel ashamed and clothe ourselves in the perfect man, and separate as he instructed us, preaching the gospel and not imposing any other rule or law beyond what the Savior taught. Upon hearing this, they began to go out and proclaim and preach. My final thoughts on the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. First, let me say, Mary Magdalene was no prostitute. Maybe Yeshua did cleanse her of seven demons, but those demons are not what Pope Gregory I erroneously claimed. No, the non-canonical texts prove who she truly was, which was someone extremely important to the Savior. Whether she was his companion or his wife is besides the point, which is that he loved her more than all others. Now, let's cover the hidden meanings in esoteric knowledge found 
in Yeshua's words. The Gospel begins with an intriguing statement that all of nature, meaning matter and spirit, will return to their prospective roots, meaning matter back to formless potentiality and spirit back to the divine realm. Does the author mean that there is no judgment in the end and that we all return to the same singularity, for lack of a better term? Next, the Savior states that sin does not exist, but instead we manifest our indulgences here in our physical forms, but that does not affect our true spiritual selves. This leads one to the Gnostic principle that we are prisoners of the demiurge here in this material world that is meant to blind us to the knowledge that we are all divine sparks. Or, sin is nothing more than a disillusion meant to keep us ignorant. After the missing pages, the text picks back up with Mary describing to the others the series of celestial gatekeepers meant to keep us from re-entering the divine realm from which we came, who she describes as the seven powers or forms. When the soul confronts desire, the term garment is meant to be your body that traps your soul. It appears that only when you can differentiate between the two you can move on to the next power of ignorance. To overcome this power, the soul must realize that it should not condemn anybody. And even though the body was bound, the soul itself did not bind. Again, this separates the garment of flesh and blood from the eternal divine that lives within each of us. Next, The soul encounters the four powers and all of its manifestations, where the soul answers to the celestial gatekeeper, what confines me has been defeated, which I contend means the ignorance of this world no longer binds me to it, as my soul has become free to return to the pleroma. I find this very important in understanding the difference between our bodies that sin out of ignorance in our soul or spirit or divine spark that is held prisoner until we realize who we truly are. After the true wisdom of the Savior's teachings is given to the other disciples, we are given a glimpse into just how women were treated in Israel in the days of Yeshua. It appears that they were almost second-class citizens, However, as we discover, Mary of Magdala was definitely no second-class citizen in the eyes of our Savior. With that, the true message found in Yeshua's final teaching to his disciples by way of Mary Magdalene was that our true nature's transcendence from the material world that binds us. With his words, look here, look there. For the Son of Man resides within you, are meant to teach us that the same passage as found in the Gospel of Thomas, that heaven is within us. In this plane of existence, which we find ourselves in, we are in the actual hell. And the only way out of this prison is through knowledge of His words that will lead us back to the salvation of the heavenly pleroma created by the indescribable and unknowable Father known as the Monad. That is an amazing work. In the few pages that it is, it covers so much and it is so deep I am just so happy I got to share it with you. I'll leave most of the interpretations that you have up to yourselves, as I always say. But I will see you again soon with another video. I love you all. Bye.